So when we talk about solar system models and the history of creating these models, this, that was one of the big things to explain was that retrograde motion. Okay, so if you wanted to trace out the curve of retrograde motion, it would sort of look like this. If you were gonna plot the position of a planet every night in the same time, um, Mercury, as we just saw, appears to be going forward for a while, then it turns back and loops around, turns around again and continues the way it started. Um, so this is the backwards motion on the celestial sphere. That's why it's called retrograde, retro meaning reverse. Um, so the first popular model of the solar system was geocentric. Um, Earth was placed at the center of the solar system in the geocentric model. Um, it has a long history dating back to 300 BC, um, but Ptolemy in 147 AD uh, was really the one who came up with a convincing argument for retrograde motion. So Ptolemy came up with the idea that perhaps the planets um, in their orbits around the Earth um, moved along in little circles, and that explained their retrograde motion. So let's say we're looking at this purple planet here, right? Um, it's motion along its orbit, it's kind of doing this, right, around the Earth, um, but meanwhile, it's going around in this circle. And so when it's going this way in its circle, it appears to be going retrograde. So that's the idea with the epicycles. And it did, it did a pretty good job of explaining and predicting the positions of the planets. Um, and so in order to use this model to put it into practice, um, Ptolemy had to come up with this complicated system of measuring different lines. So you'd have to measure lines to um, the edge of the circles, lines to the centers of the circles. You'd have to do all this complicated math um, in order to calculate the positions of the planets over time. And as a result, Ptolemy's model was very difficult to use. Um, some uh, Middle Eastern astronomers published tables that used Ptolemy's calculations uh, in order to help others to be able to predict the positions of the planets. And then even later, um, as we got into uh, manufacturing metals, uh, people started to make instruments that consisted of nested circles that you could actually manipulate in order to predict the planets, kind of like an ancient slide rule. If you're familiar with slide rules, those are ancient to us even now, even though they were used, you know, by NASA for the Apollo missions. Anyway, um, it was hard to use. This model is a pain. So that's part of what motivated the heliocentric model. All right, so in the heliocentric model, we remove Earth from the center of the solar system. And instead we say, the sun is at the center of the solar system. Um, this was proposed by Copernicus in 1534 most popularly, um, but actually it wasn't the first time that astronomers had thought maybe the sun is at the center. Um, that was actually proposed uh, by ancient Greeks as well. So the heliocentric model from Copernicus doesn't require all those complicated epicycles that Ptolemy's model did. Instead, the only thing that looks like an epicycle here is the moon in orbit around the earth, right? So instead of all of those epicycles, we're just replaced with a bunch of simple circles. In Copernicus's model, all of the planets had circular orbits. So let's compare these two models. Um, both of the models explain planetary motions in the sky. And even though Copernicus's model um, was trying to be more accurate at calculating the planet's positions, it actually really wasn't that much more accurate at the time. Um, they do make different predictions though. So you could predict uh, different phases of Venus in the two models. And also um, you could calculate the size of these orbits. And if there were some way to confirm those sizes, that would be another way that you could test the model. And um, some of the features that don't really have any relevance to the scientific aspect of the model, but they do have relevance to how we feel about the models, is that in the Ptolemaic model, um, Earth is at the center of the solar system and indeed of the whole universe. 
And this was just something that people really liked the idea of. Um, an Earth-centric worldview was very appealing. Um, but Copernicus's model, even though it didn't have the Earth at the center, which is kind of a bummer, it was way simpler, which is a bonus. So those are kind of how they stack up. So let's look at this predictions because part of the nature of science is to make predictions and test them. So if we can predict different phases of Venus and somehow test those phases, observe them, then we would have some way to distinguish between which model might be correct. So a little bit about the history of astronomy to tell you about how we got to the point where we could actually distinguish between the models. Um, Ptolemy's Almagest that published this model was in 147 AD. And it wasn't until 1473 that Copernicus published or was born and then published on the revolution of celestial orbs in the 1500s. So there's a long stretch of time where Ptolemy's model is accepted. And so it's gonna take a lot of evidence to overturn something that's been around for a thousand plus years, right? So you can imagine how tentative Copernicus might've been. And he wasn't at all really a fan of the idea that we needed to remove earth from the center of the solar system. He just noticed that it was a simpler model. That's all. He wasn't trying to make waves. Galileo, on the other hand, trying to make waves. So Galileo built on the work of astronomer Hans Lippershey, who invented the telescope in 1608. Galileo used the telescope to do some really important things. Number one, he was able to observe the phases of Venus, which we, we can observe the phases of the moon because it's a large object close to us. But with the naked eye, you cannot observe the phases of Venus. But with the telescope, Galileo could. So that's important observation number one. Number two, he observed the moons of Jupiter. So I'm going to show you that in Stellarium. All right, so here's Jupiter. And if I walk time around, you can kind of see some motion around Jupiter. Let me move, zoom in a little bit. And this is what Galileo would have been looking at in his telescope. He would have been going out at the same time every night and drawing these dots of light that he saw in his telescope around Jupiter and plotting out their positions for months until he came to the conclusion that these were moons orbiting around Jupiter. So this was a really incredible observation because it, it was the first time that we could say definitively that Earth isn't at the center of every orbit. If these moons are orbiting around Jupiter, well, the Earth isn't there, right? The Earth isn't Jupiter. Those moons are not orbiting around Earth. So Earth isn't always at the center of every orbit. So that's what's so important about uh, Galileo's observation of Jupiter. So I mentioned the phases of Venus. Um, if Venus were in orbit around the sun and the Earth were also in orbit around the sun, then you should be able to see all of the phases of Venus except for the full phase. You would never see a full Venus because it would be on the other side of the sun, right? It would be blocked by the sun. But if, the, um, if Venus were orbiting around Earth and the sun were also orbiting around Earth, you would only ever see the crescent phases because Venus would always have to be between the Earth and the sun in that model. And so if you could see a gibbous or a half phase of Venus, then that would be definitive proof that Earth is not at the center of the solar system. And so Galileo was able to observe that in his telescope. And here's an image of the phases of Venus as captured um, by an amateur astronomer. So here are the um, half and gibbous phases and then the crescent phases of Venus. And this is a fun new phase of Venus. All right. So all of this evidence, when we come back to our solar system models, um, you know, if you make a prediction and the prediction is wrong, then something is wrong with your model. So unfortunately for Ptolemy, that was kind of one of the nails in the coffin for the geocentric model.
And then the observations of Jupiter and its moons also showed that Earth wasn't always at the center of every orbit. So Ptolemy's model was laid to the wayside and Copernicus's model uh, became accepted. There was a question that I saw in the pre-quest questions about, you know, what did the common people think about Copernicus's model at the time, right? Was it accepted right away? And I don't think that um, normal everyday people were really part of this discussion as much as uh, people are as a part of the scientific discussion now. Um, part of that just has to do with whether people had the ability to access information and even just to be able to read at that time. But I don't know all the details. That's a really fascinating question. And I would love for someone to investigate that and report back if you're curious. Okay, so um, I really like this story about the geocentric and heliocentric models because it really is a great demonstration of the scientific method in action, right? We start with observations of the sky. You just see things in the sky, you're curious about them, you want to explain them. And so you come up with a model. So Ptolemy's model was a good model. It made predictions, it helped to make calculations and, and we knew where the planets would be in the sky because of the model. Um, but it also needs to make testable predictions. And the testable prediction that the geocentric model made about the phases of Venus turned out to be falsified. Um, so the experiments that Galileo was able to do with his telescope were really important to being able to test this model. All right, so that's basically the entire cycle. Um, yeah, Galileo was really the first person who brought experimentation to the field of astronomy. Um, he also did a lot of experimentation when he was under house arrest um, for that were important to physics. So uh, a lot of important stuff by Galileo that helped science advance. All right, I believe that's all for this discussion. Oh, yeah. So I asked in the pre-class question, if Earth was the only planet orbiting our sun, then do you think we would have figured out as quickly that the sun was at the center of the solar system? And almost everyone said, no, it would have been way harder because you wouldn't have had as many reference points of objects moving around us, right? You wouldn't have been able to observe retrograde motion. And maybe that wouldn't have even motivated um, us to want to understand why those motions happen right, and come up with models of the solar system. And then I really liked, this is very long, so I'm sorry that this text is really small, um, but someone mentioned all of the pieces of evidence that we would not have been able to observe. The phases of Venus, well, if we didn't have any neighboring planets, we wouldn't have any phases of other planets to observe. Um, so all of these pieces together, I think it would have been pretty difficult to figure out the structure of our solar system. It might've taken a lot, lot longer so thanks for your thoughtful responses there.